Nairobi and affiliate pro professor um, from the University of Washington. My background in is obstetrics and gynecology and epidemiology. Um, we have a, a great team of presenters this afternoon and we encourage active participation by all participants in terms of asking questions um, or clarifications or giving additional input. Um, we are privileged to have with us two uh, great presenters from Australia. We are currently uh, having a meeting with them on one of the largest randomized clinical trials that, that is going to be conducted in uh, this country together with uh, um, Ghana and South Africa on uh, preeclampsia. And uh, they were gracious enough uh, to offer to give us uh, talks on advanced research methods this afternoon. We had initially planned this to be held in-house at the University of Nairobi, but we realized because of the doctor strike and because of the many activities that are going on, it would be better to have a greater outreach by having an online uh, Zoom platform. So I'll quickly introduce them and then allow them um, to go ahead and speak. Uh, the first presenter uh, will be Professor Julie Simpson. Professor Julie Simpson is the head of biostatistics at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. She has 30 years experience collaborating on multidisciplinary research projects. Uh, so she's been working since some of us, um, uh, the audience may have not been in this planet yet. So that means you're going to have a wealth of experience shared within the short time that we have. In this project, she has worked with clinicians, uh, researchers, laboratory scientists, epidemiologists, and health policy makers at universities and hospitals worldwide. Globally, she has published more than 350 papers. Her main areas of research interest is the inter integration of biostatistics and mathematical modeling to improve the control of infectious diseases. Um, our second presenter, um, let me just get the bio quickly. Okay, okay. Okay, our second presenter is Robert Maha. Robert received a PhD in biostatistics in 2019 at the University of Melbourne, where he has progressed uh, academically and with experience is now a senior research fellow in biostatistics. His research focus is on applied Bayesian methods and novel experimental design and analysis, particularly for adaptive clinical trials. So um, with that kind of introduction, I would want to welcome Julie to start and then uh, Robert to follow, or if you want to change the order, it's still fine. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, I'll just start sharing my screen. Hopefully that's on full screen mode now. Yes, Julie, it is. Yep. Okay. So firstly, um, Alfred, so much. Thank you so much for organizing this. And um, I'm absolutely delighted. This is my first time in Kenya. Um, I've been feeding giraffes this morning at the Giraffe Center, and it was just absolutely wonderful. And it's such a great privilege to be able to speak to all of you across the University of Nairobi today. Um, it is a very big pleasure to me. Um, I'm going to start off and speak, hopefully for just under 30 minutes, I'm going to start off talking about fixed trial designs, but alternative designs to what we typically do. And then I'm going to pass over to Rob, who's going to go um, to discuss about adaptive designs. So this is just an overview of my presentation. I'm going to cover four different types of trial designs. The first one is crossover trials, which will be still at the individual level. And then I'm going to describe three different types of cluster trials, the parallel cluster randomized trial, a cluster crossover trial, and then the design for stepped wedge cluster randomized trials. 
But before I start speaking about the more advanced or complex different study designs we have, I thought I'd just do a quick recap um, with a visual depiction of an individual level fixed randomized control trial. So here we've got a bunch of participants. Um, they're colored in the color black to represent one hospital and the color red to represent another hospital. We then randomize them stratified by that hospital into receiving either a treatment or control. This is an individual, so individuals are randomized here. And then we follow them up for some outcome to compare. So one example, a study I was involved with many years ago in Vietnam might be where randomizing patients to receive adjunctive treatment of dexamethasone compared to placebo on top of their standard treatment for tuberculosis meningitis. And then we follow them up for the outcome. And in this trial, it was a composite outcome of either the patient had died or was severely disabled at nine months post the randomization to treatment. Now with crossover trials, these um, have a consort statement as well. They were an extension to randomized crossover trials. And I do strongly recommend when you start working on a trial to download these consort guidelines because they're great at guiding you through the design, but also all the things to consider when you come to the protocol and the reporting phase of the trial. So how do crossover trials work? Well, for crossover trials, individual participants now act as their own control. So they'll receive two or more interventions. And so what we have now is a within individual comparison. So the initial randomization is then followed by crossover to the other intervention. So if we look at the visual here, we can see the patients were randomized in the top row first to the intervention, followed up for their outcome measure, there then was a washout period, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more about how important that part is. And then they received the placebo or standard care and followed for the outcome. So the individuals now, because they receive both interventions, what they're randomized is to the order they receive those interventions. So here they got intervention, then placebo, and the second group got placebo followed by intervention. So maybe it's just always good to talk through examples when we're thinking about new types of study designs. And I really like to think through studies by using what we know as the PICO framework. So there was an example study published in The Lancet over 20 years ago now of a population of children with cystic fibrosis. And the intervention here was azithromycin or they received placebo. And then they were followed up and they had an outcome measure, which many of you, especially those in respiratory medicine would be familiar with, is the forced expiratory volume in one second. So here participants, as I said before, they're randomized to the sequence. So half of them would be randomized to azithromycin first, followed by placebo with a washout period in between, or they were randomized to placebo followed by azithromycin. And here's just a visual diagram of the study design in the publication. So again, you can see patients either got azithromycin or placebo tablets. They were followed up for seven months before they had um, the outcome measure done, which involves spirometry and many other measures as well. And then the, the investigators decided that a washout period of two months was sufficient before they were re-randomized, uh, uh, reallocated to the other intervention that they hadn't been randomized to in the initial stage. So what are the pros and cons of these individually randomized crossover trials? Well, let's start with the positives, the pros. So the first thing is that it has a within individual comparison. So I'm acting as my own control. I received azithromycin and then I received placebo. And so my variability in my outcome, say my forced expiratory volume for that treatment effect will be much less variable than say the difference in my forced expiratory volume with Rob and Alfred. So we reduce the variability in that outcome by having that within comparison within a participant. And because of that, it means that our sample size, we, we can get away with fewer participants than would be needed if we did a parallel group design. So a parallel group design, we would have just have half of us received azithromycin, half to receive placebo, and then we were just followed up for our forced expiratory volume measurement. But, you know, with everything, there's some positives. What's the cons? What are the things that work against this design? 
Well, there is that carryover effect of the intervention. So the design assumes this is almost zero or very small carryover effect. So we can't do it if we feel that having that zithromycin is going to have some long-term impact on the individual. The other thing is that participants can drop out of the study. And this can happen in, in all trials. But here now we're losing that gain of that within person comparison because participants may have dropped out after the first treatment and don't receive the second treatment. So they're still contributing in terms of that information from the first part, but they're no longer contributing to that within person comparison. And the other thing is really important to when you consider doing crossover trials, that they're only suitable for uh, conditions or diseases that are chronic or relatively stable. They're only useful uh, if we have really short-term outcomes, not long-term outcomes, because it could then be a very long study. We have to wait till you get that outcome to then swap the person over and follow them up again for the next outcome. And they're only suitable for interventions with short-term outcomes impact so that a washout period is feasible. So just remember in that, in that study I just described, they decided that a washout period of two months was sufficient um, for that design. So I'm just gonna throw in uh, through this talk, just some examples of whether we think each design would be appropriate or feasible. So let's go back to that tuberculosis meningitis example that I gave that was done as a parallel individual randomized trial. So the population was patients with tuberculosis meningitis. The intervention was dexamethasone plus standard treatment and the comparator was standard treatment and the outcome was death or the, they had also that composite outcome of death or severe disability at the, within nine months following treatment. Now, clearly here, I'd hope you all agree with me that a crossover trial would absolutely not be feasible. And that's because the outcome here is death. So patients will have died some of the patients will have died before they were able to be crossed over to the other treatment. So of course, that's a very um, almost silly example that we would never do a crossover trial for this outcome. But let's think now of another example. This is an example where we have patients with chronic artery disease. And here now all patients received, received what we call the NSEP step one diet, which is a national cholesterol education program. But how, patients could also be randomized to receive these 85 grams of almonds that they take daily as well. The outcome here is blood pressure and it's measured at the end of the six week or intervention control periods. Now here a crossover trial is feasible. In fact, it was actually, this is an actual trial that's being published and completed. Again, it's a, it's a disease that's chronic. It's an outcome that's short term, blood pressure measurements taken and there is availability to have a washout period between the different education program plus the diet of almonds daily. Okay, so that's, that's crossover trials. And that's just one that was at the individual level. Now I'm gonna step through the three types of design that are all involving clusters of patients. And we're gonna start up with the easiest example first, which is a parallel design called cluster randomized trial. And so again, this has another consort statement extension, which has key features about what's the rationale for why you've done this design, thinking about how you incorporate that clustering into the sample size estimation analysis, and also having a good flow chart that describes the flow of the clusters through the trial from assignment to analysis. So always find a picture again, sort of explains how this type of design works. So for on the left-hand side, you can see we've got um, all these little smiley faces. These are our individual patients in our randomized control trial, and they're randomly being allocated to either an intervention or control. On the right-hand side, we've got an example for a cluster randomized trial. So now we have our little smiley faces. They're grouped into clusters. And these clusters could be many things. So as you could see, I've had a 30 year career. So I've worked on trials where the clusters have been villages, the clusters have been schools, the clusters have been hospitals, the clusters have been health facilities or primary care places, general practices. And now what we're doing, we're no longer randomizing the individuals, but we're randomizing clusters of the individuals 
to an intervention or a control group. So why would we do that? Why would we cluster these? Why would we randomize the school instead of randomizing the individual? Well, potential reasons include, sometimes we have studies where the intervention is naturally applied at the cluster level. So at the moment I'm working on a trial as the statistician conducted in Indonesia and Fiji, where we're actually randomizing informal sediments to get this new revitalization. We're working with architects and engineers to um, change things in terms of improving the quality of water and the environment. So here the intervention has to be applied at the settlement level. It can't be applied at the participant level. Another reason might be that you want to avoid the possibility of contamination. So some other studies I've worked on has been in general practices where patients come along and they might get some education program about their care for asthma or some other, other illness. But then, you know, going to the same general practice, they might be sitting in the waiting room. They might know the people because it's from the same area. They might then share that education program or pass that over to let the person know about that. So then you get contamination of the intervention. Sometimes it's just more easy to apply the intervention at the cluster level. So sometimes I've worked in studies where we've been, um, so during the COVID pandemic, there was a study looking at improving the mental health of children, but it was easier to um, uh, do that intervention at the classroom level across to all students in that grade as opposed to at the individual level. There's also ethical considerations and often, cluster trials might enhance participant compliance that all those participants within that village or hospital or general practice are going to receive the intervention. Now, because of that, because we're now randomizing at the cluster level, when we design the study, we have to do something, a little bit of an extra step in when we're calculating that sample size. So we're randomizing at the cluster level, but often in most of these cluster trials, the measure, the outcome measure is actually being done at the participant level. So it could be some blood pressure measure, uh, could be like the study we just talking about uh, women with having preeclampsia that Alfred introduced and the reason why Robin Hine here at, in Kenya at the moment. So what we have to consider now is that people, participants in the same cluster tend to be correlated more than participants from different clusters. And this is a statistical measure that we can calculate and it's known as the intracluster correlation coefficient. And because of that, because individuals within a cluster and they've all been randomized to the same thing, behave more, their observations in their outcome are more similar than participants from a different cluster. We now need to increase the sample size compared to the sample size we would require for an individual level randomized trial. And in the, in the, what this term is called is we inflate the sample size by what we know is the design effect. And this design effect has two values when we calculate it to, and then we multiply that up to what the sample size would be if we were just doing an individual randomized trial. It depends on this intracluster correlation. So we need to get some estimate of this and also the average cluster size. So this is how many participants would be within each village general practice hospital site or whatever. Just to note though, the really key thing in cluster randomized trials is it's much better to have a larger number of clusters with less participants per cluster than a small number of clusters with many participants per cluster. And that's a really key and important thing to remember. When we actually come to do the trial after we've done the designed it, got our sample size. Now we have to think about the conduct. So because the clusters are randomized all at once, prior consent to randomization is taken at the cluster level. So, you know, we get that the school or the village or the general practice, whatever, agrees and consents to be randomized to an intervention or a control. So we get consent at the cluster level, but it's often not possible at the participant level because that cluster will then start to recruit people into their cluster for that. So participants can only then be asked for consent to receive the intervention to which their cluster group has been assigned. So you do need to think about with cluster trials, it's a little bit different in the ethics and writing the consent forms in these designs. 
The other thing is, and something important that obviously if you're working with a statistician will do is that when we come to the analysis of these trials, we need to take account that the fact of individual participants belong to different clusters and we need to um, make sure that the analysis takes that account in terms of the variance of the outcome. So what are the pros and cons for a cluster randomized trial? Well, the pros are that it evaluates interventions that are delivered at a cluster level, and there are many interventions that that is such the case that we want to explore. It avoids contamination of the intervention to individuals not randomized to the intervention, and it increases feasibility and often participant compliance for some interventions. But again, there's going to be some cons. So the sample size needs to be increased by that design effect. So we have to get an estimate of that intra-cluster correlation and an idea of how many clusters are feasible and how many individuals per cluster. A large number of clusters are required. And there can often be now a little bit of imbalance potentially between the intervention arms because we're no longer randomizing at the individual level, but we're randomizing at the cluster level. So let's look at an example and would we think this could be a cluster randomized trial? So here we have a population of individuals living in villages in Eastern Myanmar. And the intervention was that they received an anti-malarial treatment that's given daily over three days and supervised. And it's given monthly for three months to all individuals living within that village. And then the comparator would be receiving no treatment at all. And the outcome here is the prevalence of malaria, and that's collected in cross-sectional surveys performed every three months for 24 months. So I can tell you that this was a cluster randomized trial. I was involved as one of the statisticians on this trial, so it's been published. And this is an example of uh, what we do in malaria often, which is mass drug administration, usually in places that are getting closer to elimination. So we give an anti-malarial treatment to all individuals in a village, irrespective of whether they have malaria or not. And the aim is then to um, reduce the malaria prevalence. Okay, design number three, cluster crossover trials. There isn't a consort extension currently available, but I know people are working on this. Um, and there's a nice paper by Sarah Arnett who puts in the key reporting items that was published um, back in 2016. And what I've taken from her paper is I think this is a really nice diagram that explains cluster crossover trials. So let's say here we have four clusters. Again, for a cross cluster trial, I'd recommend a lot more clusters, but this is just for a visual to explain how this works. And these could be things like your intensive care unit, your ICU. So you can see here, if we had an individual randomized trial design, we would randomize equal number of participants within each cluster. So you can see here, we've got four times M participants. So you can see here M over two in within each cluster randomized. If we did a parallel cluster randomized trial, which I've just described in the last few slides, we would randomize half of the clusters to the intervention and the other half of the clusters to um, the control or alternative intervention. In a cluster crossover trial for the same number of individual participants, you now have less clusters, but every cluster acts as its own control. So it's again like that individual level crossover trial, but now we're randomizing clusters to the sequence of whether they receive the intervention first or the control. So clusters are exposed to both control and treatment conditions. And now you have these cluster periods. So here you've got, because we've only got two interventions, a treatment and a control, we've got two cluster periods. The other thing with cluster crossover trials is we have to think there's two different types of designs now. So there's a cross-sectional design or a cohort design. Now for a cross-sectional design, each cluster period consists of different individuals. So let's think about cluster one, an intensive care unit, unit. We've randomized that to receive intervention S, that's the white box first, followed by intervention T. But the, it, so it's the same ICU, but for a cross-sectional design, the individuals in those period one and period two are not the same. Maybe there might be a small number that are still in the ICU, but typically they will not be the same individuals 
um, in those different period one, period two. So that's a cross-sectional design for a cluster crossover trial. Cluster crossover trials can also have cohort designs. So here, each cluster period consists of the same individuals. So they're receiving intervention S in cluster one first, and they're still in the study, they're a follow-up cohort, and then they're now randomized, they're, they're receiving intervention T. So they're randomizing that sequence of S to T, and cluster two here is randomized to intervention T than S, but again, it's those same individuals that are going to be in periods one and period two. So if you do a cluster crossover trial, you do need to think about, is this a cross-sectional design or a cohort design within that study? Okay, so again, because we've got this clustering, we need to incorporate that into the sample size, just like I explained previously with the parallel um, cluster trial. Because the unit of the randomization is the cluster, but the outcome measure is most typically measured at the individual level. So now we need a little bit more information than just the intracluster correlation coefficient, because now we need to get two different types of measures that describe how these clusters are correlated. We need to first get a measure of the within cluster between different periods correlation. So this measures how similar patients outcomes are within the same cluster, but in different periods. And then we have the other cl cluster correlation, which we did previously for the parallel cluster um, randomized trial. Now we have a within cluster, within period correlation. So this just at a given cluster period measures how similar patient outcomes are. So we need these two correlations. Often we have an idea of the within cluster, within period correlation, because we might have got that from other cluster trials. But because there's not a lot of many cluster crossover trials, it's often hard for us to get key information on that between different periods for how similar patient outcomes are within the same cluster. So what are the pros and cons for these cluster crossover trials? Well, like with the crossover trial at the individual level, we've now got this within cluster comparison. So that variation in the outcome measure for the treatment effect should be reduced because there's less variability we would expect within clusters across periods than between clusters. So this will mean that in some cases, and, and, and often that's, it's, that's the case, but not always, that's why I just wanna make a point, a cluster crossover trial will require fewer clusters than the parallel cluster randomized trial design. However, that's only if that within a cluster, patients within the same cluster are correlated between the different periods. So you need to have that correlation to be greater than zero to get that potential gain in doing slightly less clusters than would be in a parallel design. Let's talk through the cons now. now. The carryover effect of the intervention. So the design assumes that's going to be very minimal again, just like we saw in the individual level crossover trial. Again, some clusters might drop out after the first intervention and they don't stay in it for period two when they would receive now the second intervention. And that's going to reduce our statistical power quite a bit because now we've lost that within cluster comparison. It's only suitable generally for participants with conditions or diseases that are chronic or relatively stable for when you've got those cohort designs. If it's a cross-sectional design, we've got different participants in the different periods, so that's not such the case there. Again, we need short-term outcomes that have low variation between the cluster periods. Yep, we don't want them changing a lot between the cluster periods because we're going to lose that correlation gain in doing this design type. It, again, for cohort designs where the same participants are staying in period one and period two from that cluster, we need interventions with a short-term impact so the washout period is feasible. For cross-sectional designs, we need just really that interventions at the cluster level can be crossed over easily. So in period one, if that cluster all of a sudden needs to do some intervention, in period two, can we quickly change 
that village or health facility or whatever can cross over now and deliver the alternative intervention or the standard care package. So let's think up an example here and think about would this actually be feasible to do a cluster, over, cluster crossover trial in this example. So here our population are patients attending intensive care units in Australia. And the intervention is actually, it's an interesting intervention, but it's looking at a new procedural way of improving the discharge planning of the patients. So it's actually gonna change some procedures in the hospital of how things are done when a patient comes up to their discharge planning. And it's gonna compare that to just standard procedures of how things are currently done, the current procedures for discharging patients from the ICU. And the outcome is measured at the individual level. This is the length of stay in the ICU. So it has to be a cluster trial here because we're changing the procedures in the hospital for discharge planning at the ICU. So it definitely has to be a cluster trial. And then we're recording that for all patients attending the ICU over a six month period. Now, because we're just, you know, as long as the hospital can say, right, this is what we're doing for this period, for this six months, and then we're gonna, and then we're gonna flip back to the standard procedures at the next six months, or another ICU might say, right, we're just staying with the standard procedures for this six months, and then the next six months, we're gonna change and implement the new procedural intervention. So that looks like it's potentially feasible. And this has been done with a study um, uh, at the ICU. And really a lot of the thinking around coming up with these cluster crossover trials, especially getting used in Australia, is that we're quite limited in how many ICUs there are across Australia. So to do sometimes that parallel cluster trial design, it actually needs far too many ICUs that's feasible across um, nationally. But doing the cluster crossover trial because patients' length of stay of ICU sometimes can be quite similar in different areas for different hospitals, we could get away with slightly less clusters and do this crossover trial design. And it was feasible to change this procedural thing at each hospital over the different six month periods. Okay, so just probably in the last five minutes, I'm just gonna talk through the last design and then I'm gonna pass over to Rob. So this is known as a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial, and it does have a consort statement um, that was published back in 2018 by Carla Hemming and other authors. And just like with the other cluster trials, it need the statement specifies about you want to say why you've got a really key rationale for doing this step wedge design instead of say a parallel design. And again, you want to incorporate the clustering in sample size analysis and have a good um, flow chart figure describing the steps and number of periods. So I find step wedge trials, it's easiest to probably just look first at that picture in the second half, bottom half of my slide. Here we have example of clusters, I'll call them villages, because that's the example of one of the studies I've worked on in Myanmar, where we had a bunch of villages. So let's say we've got 12 villages here. We measured all their baseline measurements first in one time point, and then randomly villages were randomized to a sequence, a timing of when they crossed over from the control to the intervention. So you can see here cluster one, actually gets a baseline measurement and then it's straight into the intervention. And then for the next 12 periods, it's all getting measured and the, and the, and the village is exposed now to the intervention. So what the, why do people like step wedge designs? Well, they're really attractive because all clusters receive the intervention and that can be really um, a great way of sometimes when people are going to put in the intervention anyway, uh, the clusters are then really excited to be part of it, the villages and that, because they're all going to receive the intervention. And all that's different is that they don't, you know, they're going to be randomized to when they receive that intervention. So when they cross over from the control to the intervention period. And as you can see here, as you go along in time in the periods, more and more, more, more clusters are in the intervention period towards the end of the study. So if you look at period three, Three of the clusters have the intervention, nine are still just getting standard um, control thing. But if you get as far along as period 10, you can see we've now got 10 clusters have received the intervention, their post-intervention measurement, while two clusters are still in the control measurement stage. 
So the timing of the implementation of the intervention is indicated by steps with how many steps you're gonna do and the lengths of these steps determined by the study design. So I'd really recommend if, you, if the step wedge design looks like what you need to do, really important that you talk with a statistician to work with coming up with this design for you. Um, just to say, because you don't need to just do one cluster that swaps over at each time, you could have four or five clusters stopping, uh, swapping over at each of the implementation steps. And, and statisticians can work through with um, helping design that with you. So why do we do step wedge cluster randomized trials? Again, the consort said we have to really specify and make it clear what's our rationale. Well, it's really in most of the examples I've worked in that some was when villages received a, a new way of doing integrated healthcare or receiving an intervention like repellent and other prevention things for sort of um, diseases from mosquitoes or other things. It was really socially appealing that all clusters, all villages, all healthcare facilities receive that intervention. So these designs are really used much more at the stage when we're wanting to evaluate how interventions would work in real world settings. Because the other thing is often, and when we've worked in some of these with government and other things, governments decided they're going to roll out and give an intervention. And so we as, as, as researchers will say, well, would you mind doing it in this step wedge design because that we can then do an evaluation of how it's worked in that way of doing this rollout. So it actually gives us a little bit of a design to actually evaluate it. What things do we need to think about when choosing this design? Well, one of the key things is the effect of that intervention might be confounded by some changes in time. So we really need to think, would that intervention change its effect over the time or years? Because that really means then it's probably not gonna be great to do a step wedge design. Our sample size calculations and analysis now have to allow for both the clustering nature of the design, but also that timing, the temporal part, because we're randomizing individuals are going to swap from control to intervention at different times. So we have to take into some of that, get some information about potential confounders that could confound that intervention effect because they're influencing the outcome to change over time. And also remember, we've got to think, would the effect of the intervention somehow vary over the duration of the study? Are there going to be other external factors coming in that could influence that effect of the intervention if we're going to do this step wedge design where the timing of that intervention varies for different clustering groups? So here's the pros and cons. The pros are it evaluates interventions that are delivered at the cluster level which was the same for cluster trials and cluster crossover trials. It avoids contamination of the intervention to individuals not yet randomized to the intervention. So we get that bit where um, we're clustering at the cluster level, we avoid that contamination problem. Often a lot of the time participants uh, really wanna comply and be part of this for some of the interventions and it, and it makes it more feasible especially because all clusters receive the intervention. So it evaluates how an intervention would be implemented in practice. The cons is we've got to remember now that we're not just randomizing half to receive the intervention at one single time point and half don't receive the intervention. And then we just follow with time. We're now changing in terms of, if we think back to our diagram, how many are in the intervention period or the control period over time. So we've got this temporal confounding effect. The intervention might change over time and the sample size now needs to be increased by a design effect. So we've got these intra-cluster correlations within a single time point, across time point, et cetera. We've got to get information on that to help us design the study. We need a large number of clusters. And the key thing I wonder this final point is really important. The trial might take a very long time because it, you've got to do all these time periods of steps. So I know many years ago, maybe probably about seven years ago, step wedge trials became quite trendy in Australia. Many people were approached me going, oh, hey, Julie, I want to do a step wedge design and that. But when you started to think about their outcome measure and the time taking to do all these period steps of 
converting from the control period to intervention, the study was going to take five years compared to, say, a parallel cluster trial that maybe would only take two years. So it was really sort of thinking pragmatically about is that the right approach? Okay, so let's just finish up with an example. So would a step wedge cluster trial be appropriate or feasible here? So we've got individuals attending general practices in areas of Sydney and Melbourne with high levels of refugees that have been resettled in those areas. And the intervention is to train general practice teams such that they optimize their care of these refugees compared to just the standard care. So actually giving extra training to make sure that they improve the care for these new refugees that have resettled into these areas. The outcome will be the proportion of patients from refugee backgrounds that actually got well-documented health assessments, and this is collected over 12 months. So this was a step wedge design because they, again, it was something they wanted to do, evaluate as an implementation in sort of real world, world practice. The agreement was that all general practices would receive this new training, but what they did was they randomized the general practice as to the timing of when they changed from doing standard care to then now implementing this new training of the general practice teams to improve refugee care. So I'm gonna go quite quickly over the summary because it really just covers key points. So in summary, crossover trials are really suitable for short-term outcomes. So not things where we've got to follow patients for a very long time for the outcome to occur. They must be for interventions that have no carryover effect because that's a key assumption of these individual crossover trials and also at the cluster level. And it must also be feasible and ethical to say to participants, hey, I'm going to randomize you to receive either intervention A and then intervention B or intervention B and then intervention A. And that sample size and statistical analysis needs to account for the fact that we have participants acting as their own control. We've got this within participant variation. For the parallel type cluster randomized trials, these are really suitable for interventions delivered at cluster level or interventions where we know there could be potential contamination if we delivered them at the individual level. Again, sample size and statistical analysis needs to take account of this clustering. So we have to think about it both at the design stage and at the final stage of the study when we come to the statistical analysis. Cluster crossover trials have all the same sort of caveats that we had for the individual level crossover trial. But now the sample size and statistical analysis has these two measures of clustering correlation which are within and between clusters, but between periods or within the period. So it gets a little bit more complicated now. And finally, step wedge cluster trials, also like cluster crossover trials, suitable for short-term outcomes and really suitable for interventions that are going to be given to all the clusters, the villages, the general practices, they're all gonna be given, but at least we can do randomize the rollout so that we can evaluate the design. But we've got to be thinking carefully about what other things might be changing over that time period. And there's some reference. And thank you very much. I shall stop sharing my screen and pass over to Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. As Rob prepares to uh, give his talk, I would encourage the participant to post questions on the Q&A and note the chat box. Q&A. Thank you. Sorry, I'll just get that shared again. Okay, hopefully everybody can uh, see and hear me now. Um, so like Julie- this yes, is we, first... yes, we can, we can hear you, yeah. Thanks Alfred. Um, like Julie, yeah, this is the first time uh, that I've ever been to Kenya and we're really excited to be here and uh, grateful for the opportunity to um, to present. So um, thank you, Alfred, for, for organizing. Um, so what, what I wanna to talk to you about today is simulating clinical trial power. Um, so you might be wondering why why I think it's important to, to talk about this with clinicians. 
And that's because as clinical trials get more complex, like what Julie's just shown there, um, we need to actually simulate uh, simulate how they perform. And this idea of simulation is often not clear um, to, to a lot of clinicians who, who might not have come across it before, but also to even less experienced statisticians. So what I really want to focus on is the concept. So <laughs> I'm not intending to give a... a post lunchtime stats lecture, but I'd really, um, really hope that you can walk away with a, a, at least a better understanding of, of simulating clinical trials. And then when uh, you encounter it in practice, you, you've got a better um, foundation to move, move forward with that. So uh, just what I, I'm going to attempt to cover um, in, in this time is, is adaptive trials, what Julie um, hasn't covered is a new uh, innovative trial design called adaptive trials, which are exploding in popularity. Uh, I'll talk about what operating characteristics are and how they relate to trial design and simulation. I'll talk about how a, a fixed sample size trial would be simulated and then talk, extend that to, um, to how we would simulate an adaptive trial um, and then finish with some of the benefits and and some of the challenges of simulation. So again, the aim is general understanding. Uh, <clears throat> so like Julie presented, it's it's uh, quite useful at the start to establish uh, a, a, some, um, uh, some baseline ideas about what we mean when we're talking about a, a fixed um, trial design. And so here we we have it's a different schematic, but should be familiar. We randomize to patients to either a control or an intervention in the two arm study, and we proceed to the final planned sample size and do the analysis. Uh, the problem is that we don't actually know the inputs into that sample size, so there's quite a bit of uncertainty, and that uncertainty is not resolved until final analysis. Well. And so by reducing that initial uncertainty or uncertainty during the trial, we can lead to more efficient trials. So uh, this leads us to, to this concept of adaptive designs. Um, the, the FDA has released some uh, really useful guidances on adaptive designs, and it's a signal that they've really, um, they've really come into their own over the recent years, over recent years. So the FDA's definition of adaptive design is one that um, it's a clinical trial design that allows for prospectively planned modification. So it has to be a priority to one or more aspects of the design based on accumulating data. So based on data that's not necessarily um, the, the data that we'd have at the end of the trial, it could be half, at a halfway point. So the basic idea to, to take that schematic another step further is that we we do the same thing. We randomize amongst the control and in, intervention, but we perform an interim analysis where we evaluate the efficacy of the, the intervention. And we we want to we try and make a conclusion about whether that intervention is effective. If it is, well, we just stop the trial there at the reduced sample size and we do the final analysis. And if it's not, no big drama, we just continue on to the uh, the final analysis at the planned sample size. So this is the basic idea about an, an adaptive trial. They can get much more complicated than this. There, there are a lot of trials that look as simple as this. Um, there's other, other approaches which include um, uh, potentially uh, recalculating your sample size to, um, to expand the, the scope of the trial at some point during the trial as well. But basically, the basic idea is that an adaptive design is, is an insurance policy um, against some of the uncertainties inherent in designing uh, a prospective experiment. So why it should, I guess, be obvious to a lot of people why we use an adaptive design in some contexts, um, but I'll just go through them here. Uh, centrally, they're better for patients in a lot of cases because you have fewer patients randomised to an inferior treatment um, and so, so less harm to those patients. Uh, <clears throat> we are able to learn quickly about treatment efficacy. So this is really this was really important in the uh, um, during the COVID pandemic, where 
uh, the the, the, popul the global population could benefit from uh, knowing what treatments were efficacious. So we needed to get to that answer really quickly. And getting to that answer more quickly had uh, enormous benefit for, for the population at large. There are better use of resources. Um, obviously, healthcare resources in every setting uh, are, are scarce, and we want to not spend expend those resources uh, where we don't have to. So we can we can have quicker and smaller trials, and we can then devote those resources to other things. For example, other trial designs. There are limitations to adaptive designs. Um, there are limitations to all uh, all. Uh, innovative or complex trial designs. Um, so adaptive designs don't escape. Um, the, the, the first limitation is really they don't work so well with long-term primary outcomes. Uh, and that's particularly the case where um, you might have a relatively long-term outcome relative to the uh, potential recruitment onto the trial. So what you don't want to end up in the situation where you, uh, you've recruited your entire sample size before you can actually conduct an interim. Uh, if you do stop the trial early, you might actually miss out on collecting important secondary information that, uh, that, um, that can inform uh, clinical decision-making. They're more complex. Um, they're, they're more complex to design, they're more complex to understand in some cases. And they're also, there's an element of operational complexity uh, in terms of even getting um, getting everybody in the room at the same time to conduct uh, and review multiple interim analyses. Uh, in, in some cases, they the, the additional cost, upfront cost is higher, um, but that can also be recovered. Um, Re recovered by uh, the, the the nature of the design and stopping early. There's challenges methodologically. Um, uh, the, the in some cases, particularly complex adaptive designs, there's a lot of scope for um, for uh, statistical research to try and overcome some uh, some some challenges that that arise by stopping the trial early and communication but we've been really trying hard at least in uh in australia to to educate um the the clinical community around adaptive designs and to try and familiarize um familiarize uh trialists with with their their um their potential benefits so uh, you know we understand trials um, trial designs and the performance of trial designs by what we call operating characteristics. So these, uh, this is a, just a catch-all really um, for the trial power, which is just the true positive rate um, for, for your trial if you were to conduct the trial uh, a large amount of times. Uh, the type 1 error, which is uh, similar to the power, it's the false positive rate. So um, how many times, if there was no effect in your trial, you would conclude can make a positive a positive conclusion and the sample size. So for simple designs like the two 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 arm design with a fixed um, sample size, we have equations that we can usually uh, obtain sample sizes very easily. Um, for adaptive trials, those equations more often than far more often than not for some simple adaptive designs they exist, but far or more often than not. Um, they don't exist. So what we have to do is we have to uh, to get at these operating characteristics. We need to use um, a probabilistic simulation. So what's probabilistic simulation? Uh, there's different kinds of simulation, I guess, depending on who you talk to or what what their familiarity with with the the word simulation means. We can have interactive simulations. So you're probably all quite familiar with something like this. You could si simulate in a in a training environment, an artificial training environment, something like airway management, where you're not actually working with um, with a, a real person, but you're conducting something that's interactive 
it's close. It's an, an an analog of the real world without it, the the consequences of the real world, and we can also see this um, in something like uh, you know working on the Hubble satellite um, under underwater rather than out in space because it's much cheaper to do it in a big swimming pool than to send astronauts out into Earth's orbit before they um, before they're ready. Uh, we can have sort of deterministic simulations, so we can have a, a we can produce sort of computer analogs of the real world. So we might see this in sort of industrial design or product design, or in architecture and engineering. <clears throat> and then we have probabilistic simulation. So this occurs from in this picture is a nicer it's sort of representation of a naturally occurring probabilistic simulation, but basically it's. Um, we're, we're looking at the effect of uh, repeated natural experiments in order to, or repeated artificial experiments, in this case a natural one, in order to try and understand underlying processes. So like I said, a probabilistic simulation, we, we, what we're doing is randomly generating virtualizations, so ver like, uh, artificial data sets to understand this, uh, these underlying processes. Um, <clears throat> probabilistic simulations are really useful in uh, designing new statistical methods. Um, and that's particularly where the mathematics is intractable. What it really involves is just making sampling data from a computer, using a computer to, to artificially sample um, data repeatedly. <laughs> Pardon me applying a method to that data so taking a mean of that data and then checking the aggregate results and seeing whether those aggregate results um, make sense particularly to to the the data generating process that you used um, to sample your data so in terms of uh, clinical trial simulation this this means that we are running artificial trials a large number of artificial trials with randomness so we're sampling data and using that in to, to produce an artificial trial. We're performing the trial analysis and then we're checking to see how many times that trial succeeded. So the basic simulation workflow is to, uh, is to just, we start a new trial, a single artificial trial, and we simulate the complete trial data. This is not for an adaptive trial, this is for a fixed design. Um, and then we conduct the final analysis. We store that result on the computer, and if if we don't have enough simulations to to be confident in in the operating characteristics like power, for example, um, that we can produce, we go back and simulate new trials. If we are confident, we can stop the simulation, and we can take the aggregate results, and from that we derive the operating characteristics. And I'll show exactly what it means, um, exactly how that that um, works to derive the operating characteristics in the next slides. So it's important to note that this workflow is only, it's for a specific scenario. So this could be, a, by scenario, I mean, uh, it could be an odds ratio scenario. So we have a null scenario where there's no effect. Um, it could be one where there's a large effect, a small effect. Uh, uh, there's an entire continuum from which we can we can pull scenarios from. So in, in this slides, I just want to try and demonstrate without uh, mathematics what a, a simulation looks like. So here we've got uh, <clears throat> we've got a control and an intervention group, and we want to sample data from those from those groups. So here we've got um, uh, we've uh, a column of saying first simulation. So we'd store our data there and we simulate data for patients in each um, of the control and intervention group. So in this, in this case, we perform the simulations and we end up with outcomes in each, um, in each group for that simulation. And then we conduct another simulation. And so that simulation, because we're sampling, there's randomness, there's going to be differences. And we do it again and so on. And we might do that up to a thousand simulations, um, often quite quite a bit more. And there's an entire methodology for trying to figure out 
exactly how big your simulations should be, but a thousand is the sort of um, ballpark minimum uh, that that we tend to um, tend to think about. So what do we do with this data? We come up with an analysis method. And then in this case, this is a statistical test of some sort. So maybe maybe um, a t-test or a chi-squared test. And what we want to do is we want to apply that test to the simulations, each simulated data set um, individually, and we want to store the result. So in this case, we want to do the test and we want to see if there's significant statistical significance. So has the trial succeeded? Um, in demonstrating statistical significance. So we take that data from the first simulated trial, we do the test, we get a p-value less than 0.05. Um, it should say that the, the simulated, we have a yes, so that's a successful, um, a successful trial. Uh, we do it on the second um, simulation and we end up with a p-value greater than 0.05, so it's not, um, it's a it's not a successful trial, and we continue that on for a thousand um, simulated data sets. And it's actually quite um, it's it, it's quite nice to see how power this central operating characteristics falls out of this simulation because all the power is, or estimated power in this case, is the proportion of that thousand trials that reject the null hypothesis. Um, or, or that were that that were successful, um, assuming that we've we've done it, we've simulated data according to a null hypothesis. So, uh, for a given sample size, if um, if we have uh, if we do simulate um, assuming a null hypothesis, so that's our simulation truth, then the power is simply the type one error, so the false positive um, rate. If we simulated, uh, if we conducted these simulations and we used a, a large effect size, for example, then power would just be our power. So it's important to realize that simulated power is estimated in this case. So we're actually, we're estimating power. Um, we're using data to try and derive power. We're not using an analytical solution. Um, and so we can achieve better accuracy with more simulations. So it, we might may need to, depending on the context, do more than a thousand simulations. So there's some elements uh, that go into any trial simulation. So we can do trial simulations and, and for complex fixed trial designs, like some multi-arm designs with complicated endpoints, we do use simulation because um, the 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 uh, the math mathematics, like I said before, uh, are often intractable. So we need to know what our clinical endpoints are, and that's a given. And and we also need to sort of work that into a an overarching estimate. So we need to know, um, you know, what our objective objectives are, what our population is, what our um, what our summary statistics will be that we'll use in to to make trial conclusions. Um, so we'll need to know effect sizes. There'll be a number of effect size scenarios that we need to consider. So in this case, yeah, we can consider the null. Um, and we always, almost we'll always consider the null scenario to obtain the type one error. But then we consider quite a few alternative variations. Um, <clears throat> we need to think about how treatments will be randomized. So the number of treatments we'll include in the trial the randomization ratios amongst those treatments. So do we randomize 50-50? Um, if there's three treatment arms, do we randomize uh, one third to each or try and protect the control arm at 50%? Um, <clears throat> and then we need to, to, to have an idea of what our sort of planned or, or our feasible sample size is. Uh, we need to think like, like I showed in the previous slides, we need a, a method of analysis, a statistical test, if you will. So um, different methods work differently for different designs. So we need to make decisions around that. Um, and we need to think about thresholds for making that conclusion. And I'll come to that in a moment. But we've got, um, a, you know, p-value of less than 0.05 is the, the, traditional, um, the traditional threshold for making uh, decisions in, in most um, phase three trials, 
but in in simulated trials and particularly adaptive trials, we often need to change that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we need to also think about the simulation methods. Um, how, the me what we'll use um, when we're actually simulating. So, like I said, the number of simulations to be confident in our estimated power. So should that be a thousand? Should it be 2000? In some cases it can be less, it can be a hundred. Um, but we need to often do pilot simulations to try and figure out um, what that number is. Um, and that's that's related to something called Monte Carlo error. So we end up with, um, with, with I guess you can think of confidence intervals around our power estimates. Um, and that's derived from Monte Carlo, Carlo error. Uh, simulations really computationally intensive. Some are simple and you can run on a laptop, but a lot aren't. And so you need to consider the, the availability of computational resources before diving into a simulation. Um, and that leads, often we need to use uh, high performance clusters. And we're lucky enough to have quite a few of those um, at the institutions we work at, but Alternatives exist, um, for example, uh, Amazon Web Services um, is also able to provide that sort of computational resources. Uh, so elements of adaptive design simulations, there's a few other things we need to consider. So there's timing, um, because we're not just, I mean, recruitment may rate matters in a fixed design, but it's much more important in, adap in ad adaptive design. Um, particularly if our endpoint is somewhat long-term. So we need to know what the expected rate of recruitment is and potentially any ramp-ups. Like, are we going to be ramping the trial up over, over one or two years and then hitting a, 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 um, a stable rate of recruitment? Or is there going to be some other sort of um, characteristic recruitment rate? Uh, like, like I just mentioned, that that's related to the time to clinical endpoint. Um, we need to think about what number of interim analyses we want to perform. Um, so do we just want to do one interim analysis when we want to do that? So um, do we want to do that in terms of, often we don't in terms of calendar time, but um, is this when we recruit um, 500 patients or when we observe the endpoints for 500 patients? If we do more than one interim analysis, how should that be spaced? When should we start the first one? Um, should they be equally spaced? And these are all things that we can only really, we have sort of, there are certain theoretical um, um, sort of guides to what we what is a reasonable number and timing of our intimate analyses, but we need to simulate to really um, figure out what the effect on the, the operating characteristics are. Uh, like I said before, we have thresholds to consider, um, and we can consider these at each interim often. Um, so do we fix the, the thresholds? Do we use 0.05 for each interim analysis, or do we use something more conservative initially and then uh, relax that as we collect more data? And then what kind of adaption, adaptations do we want to make in our adaptive design? Do we want to stop the trial early? Um, and And... And, uh, and make conclusions? Do we want to not do any early stopping? Do we want to just um, use what's known as response adaptive randomization, where we uh, modify the randomization ratio to, um, to uh, be weighted in favor of the better performing um, treatment? Uh, and then there's other forms like enrichment, which I won't cover, but... Um, but basically mean that should we be uh, should we be targeting populations more in which rec trying to recruit from populations where the treatment uh, is showing efficacy. So in terms of these interim analyses and our thresholds, so why do we need to change these thresholds? And that's because multiple looks at the data inflate your type one error, your po false positive rate. And this is common to both frequentist and Bayesian designs. So in fact, most Bayesian adaptive designs that we, we, we produce are actually, um, are actually hybrid Bayesian frequentist designs because um, <clears throat> despite 
there being a common belief that Bayesian designs don't need to consider things like false positive rates. Uh, most people, funders, regulators, almost everybody else wants those Bayesian designs to have good frequentist characteristics. And so we do simulations to show that these designs do have um, do have good frequentist characteristics. So if we look more at the data, we inflate our type one error more. That's just a, a um, central theoretical result in statistics. In adaptive designs, yes, that means we we inflate our type one error, but we can also um, it improves our chances of stopping earlier, and it can also give us more power. So there's a trade off there. <clears throat> so we have these decision making thresholds. In this case, we we use p values, but these can also be in a Bayesian context, these could be posterior probabilities. <clears throat> so, like I said before, we might make we might start with very conservative p-values. Can be much more conservative than what I've got there. Um, can be 0. 0.00005 at the first interim, and then relax those. Um, this kind of conservatism it lessens the type one error, but it often leads to lower power as well. So we need to 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 try a number of different, um, often try a number of different um, threshold types. It's important to sort of note that, that this interim timing, it's not just a statistical decision, it's also what's feasible. Um, like I said, it's hard to get uh, the, the date, clean data in time and everyone in a room to evaluate efficacy if the interim is being performed every month. So um, so often it's it's about feasibility rather than the statistical properties. So often we're, we're more focused on tweaking these decision-making thresholds rather than the interim timings. Um, and, and as a consequence of all of this, sometimes that first interim might need to be quite late. So around the halfway mark to control type one error. So just I'm going to attempt to extend the basic workflow that I showed before to an adaptive trial, just to try and um, cement the concept. So what we do, we start our, we start simulating our trial. So we simulate a single trial. So our first, first simulation, we simulate up to, to, to an interim analysis and we conduct that analysis. We, do we stop the trial? No, we don't. We simulate up to the next interim and we say, do we stop the trial? And we do that um, on and on and on until we do stop the trial. And that can be at the final analysis. So once we do that, we do <clears throat> what we did before. Are we confident that we've got enough data to, to have a, a robust simulation? If not, we go back and do this, start simulating more trials. And if we do, we go and derive our operating characteristics. So there are benefits to simulation other than just being able to obtain the operating characteristics. Um, we can incorporate other sources of uncertainty like recruitment rates that aren't typically uh, able to be recruit incorporated in analytical sort of sample size calculations. Um, they're a really good touchstone um, to, to figure out what's really important um, to investigators and what the clinical context uh, in which the investigators want to run the trial really is because you've got to you've you've got to put all of these things down on paper before doing the simulation um, they really encourage dialogue and this is speaking from experience that the uh, it's an iterative process where you do a, you might simulate a certain design and you take that to the clinical investigators and they um, decide that it's not appropriate or that they want to make some modifications and you go back and you re-simulate and that dialogue allows the investigators to learn more about the, the trial design that they're interested in but it also encourages statisticians as well to learn more about the clinical context so it's a really quite a nice, um, almost pedagogical tool as well. 
And related to that, it's a, it's a nice way for the investigators to practice the trial. So to, to think about, well, we're going to invest all this money into this trial design. Is it going to do what we think it's going to do? Um, and, and that's incorporating all of these sources of uncertainty. So we can try and be as complex as, as computational as we can be, as is computationally feasible, but we also have to be aware of um, some of the pragmatic limitations. And central to this is this sort of <clears throat> computational challenge uh, that statistician, statisticians focus no matter when they do simulations. And it's this curse of dimensionality. So it's best demonstrated by basically, we can look, think about it as having five scenarios that we're interested in. So a null scenario and three effect scenarios. So, um, you know, a, a scenario where the, where there's, a, you know, evidence of harm in the intervention and three effective scenarios. <clears throat> um, then we might, might want to consider five different interim schedules. So, um, you know, an interim schedule where we stop at the halfway point only, where we stop every, um, where we stop three times, so on. And we might consider five of those. So now we're, we're working with 25 simulations. And then we might need to consider different, um, different recruitment rates, for example, or different thresholds um, on those interim analyses. So we end up very quickly uh, expanding our number of simulations to, for, to with just five different sort of design choices in each area, we've got 125 simulations to run. And these simulations, each one of these little cubes can represent a substantial amount of computational time. So running these in sequence might not be feasible. And hence why I alluded to the fact that sometimes you need to go to... to um, uh, you need to be able to access high-performance computing resources to actually make these simulations feasible in a lot of cases. So some things just to consider um, knowing all of these things now. If you were to think about doing a, a trial that required simulation, um, my advice would be to start small. So start with the simplest example and scale up from there. If you start with something too complex, um, you'll just run into trouble. Um, it's important to know that despite the fact that we can include all these sources of uncertainty, that simulation model will be simpler than the real world model. So we might not include all the covariates um, in a regression model of the trial outcome. It will be simpler than that. And that's by necessity. Um, <clears throat> it would be to maintain that constant dialogue, keep learning from each other, and that really um, that really supports robust simulations. Um, and the last point, I guess, is if you are thinking of uh, of designing a trial that requires uh, substantial simulations, um, <clears throat> and for the purposes of submitting a grant, or um, if you need to provide some preliminaries to an ethics board, it might not be feasible to actually do the simulation. And you may need to take a step back and look at what the fixed design looks like and take that first fixed design and work from there. But you may need to make ad, ad hoc justifications for your more complex design based on a fixed design. And, um, and sometimes that's all that it's feasible because you don't have six months uh, or three months or however long it takes to actually get the simulations completely finalized um, in, in a lot of these cases. So we need to do um, the best we can. So just to recap what we've covered, we just talked about what adaptive trials are and operating characteristics, so power and type one error. Um, so sort of motivated why, why simulations need and in some contexts and talked about how a fixed trial might be simulated and the workflow of that. And then for adaptive trials, um, how we might simulate uh, the workflow in, in order to simulate an adaptive trial and what goes into that. And then uh, to conclude, we just talked about some of the benefits of the simulation and, and also some of those computational challenges. So thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Rob, uh, for the great presentation and for the clarity of presentation and again for keeping time. So mm -hmm. we have great audience here. And if somebody has a question, you can raise up your hand. Otherwise, um, I'm going to go through some of the questions that were asked in the chat box. Okay, there's a lot of uh, applause. Uh, there are a lot of appreciation of the great presentation. I'm sure if we were in a room, the room, room would be full with noise and cheering <laughs> for the great work that you have, have shared with us. Very enlightening. So the first question is to Julie um, about um, the washout period for uh, crossover trials. What do you consider and what duration is uh, adequate for washover period? Yeah, so so it'll vary from study to study because it'll depend on the effect of the or expected effect of the intervention on the outcome measure. So you could see the example I showed of the zithromycin and placebo for forced expiratory volume. Obviously, they had clinical knowledge to decide that two months after two months, those treatments would no longer be having an impact on that forced expiratory volume. So the participants back at sort of the start again baseline. So it really needs a lot of discussion. And if it's a real unknown and it's not sure and, and it might be longer than what they think or less, it's maybe better not then to go with a crossover trial. Pathophysiology uh, yep. and the mechanism of action, duration of Absolutely. action. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Um, the next question is from Penina. Do you uh, do interim analysis in crossover trials and at what point? Yeah. So it, it's rare to do an interim analysis um, because you wouldn't want to do it after you're partway through because the study has been statistically powered to get to the end. Um, so, you know, it'd have to have a strong reason as to why you're wanting to do that interim analysis. Uh, to, to go ahead with that, yeah. So typically we uh, do interim analyses for some reason about, uh, you know, we're thinking we've got some rules about we're gonna stop this trial or other, otherwise we really just uh, have the DSMB looking at safety reports. Oh, okay. And that probably answered the next part of the question. If you do and find the intervention to be better, how do you ethically justify a switch to the, you know, to the other arm? Um... Yeah, so it's All really, right. yeah, it's assuming you wouldn't be doing that unless you've made a real pre-specified that you felt you needed to look at it after the first stage, yep. Okay, excellent, excellent question there. Uh, Peter is asking which design would be appropriate if you needed to evaluate different prevention interventions to different groups, uh, like the care, uh, HIV prevention interventions. Yep, so I have done a cluster trial on interventions to prevent HIV. So that was done as a cluster trial and it was a parallel design. Um, so, you know, clusters of groups, it was general practices got an education intervention um, for preventing HIV and then and then the patients were, were followed up. Yep. Okay, excellent. In case of carrying out, this is from Wycliffe, in case you are carrying out a cluster randomized trial on vaccines, can the concept of herd immunity be impact your outcome? Yes, yes. So um, so I'm actually on the DSMB. We've got the meeting next week for a vaccine trial that's a cluster trial at the moment um, being done in the Gambia. And uh, I think what you need to think about is how much movement of people you have between clusters. So if you're randomizing villages to the vaccine, is there potential that a lot of people migrate and move in and out of villages? And is there the potential then for some herd immunity effect to be happening? And maybe you wanna select geographically a little bit more separation across those clusters, yeah. Okay, um, the next question is to Rob, what's the, ethical ceiling for computations? Um, uh, um, that question could mean a, a, a number of things, I think. Um, I, I mean, the, the the ceiling in terms of what, what's possible in, in terms of computations is whatever you can afford, really. Um, while you can uh, rely on on institutional computational resources uh, in some contexts, um, like I said, those might not be available or they might not be enough. And in those cases, um, you'd need to uh, to um, 
switch to to something like Amazon Web Services in order to uh, increase that that sort of um, that the the resources that are available to to you to to be able to perform those simulations. Um, in terms of what an ethical ceiling is for computation, I'm I'm not sure I understand exactly what that concept is. Um, so uh, if if that attendee can can clarify that, that would be um... yeah. Um, so anonymous attendee, if you can clarify that, it would be helpful. Uh, the next part of his question, his or her question was, how do you measure the accuracy of the simulation vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the real? I guess he's saying the uh, the real population. I guess probably he means um, he or she means you know completing the study without simulation. How do you measure that accuracy? Uh, so, I mean, simulations are really an a priori tool to try and ensure that you get um, the, the, the design that you implement in the real world works. Uh, and it's exactly the same with a sample size, uh, a, a standard sample size calculation. So um, there's, I mean, we, we can also, uh, we can ensure that we have accurate simulations by, um, in terms of the uncertainty around our simulations by increasing um, the, the number of simulations we do. And so that that ramps up the, the com computational resources we need. But that doesn't say how well that design will actually apply. Um, that when we take that scary step and go and take the, this virtual simulation and apply it to the real population. Um, there, by nature, the adaptive design is an insurance policy against simulations that aren't, um, uh, aren't possibly completely, uh, well, a, a relatively um, a good representation of reality because at that interim, uh, that, that first or second or third interim analysis, uh, there's, we can, we can, uh, uh, we evaluate decision rules that let us um, stop the trial early. For example, if we've got it wrong, and the the um, in reality, the uh, the the treatments um, overwhelmingly efficacious, uh, or likewise, if we um, if we got it wrong at the start, and um, and we didn't we didn't actually have a high enough maximum sample size, we can have adaptations that allow us to um, expand that um, sample size as well. Okay, um, a couple of questions again. Um, for Rob, what's the uh, learning curve for statisticians who may be interested in this approach? Um, what do, do you think is the learning curve? Uh, it's it, it's steepish, but not insurmountable. If uh, if you've got an interesting interesting problem. Um, if you're working with motivated clinicians uh, and you have the, the sort of baseline foundational statistical and um, I guess computational skills, you can use a statistical programming language um, you know, quite competently. Then uh, particularly if you have guidance from someone who is accomplished in, in running simulations, then you can actually learn to perform simple simulations quite quickly. Um, that said, doing a simulation for a very, very, like a, for a big multi-arm, uh, multi-domain adaptive trials with a lot of uncertainty um, and a lot of inputs uh, does require um, quite, quite a bit of, um, a bit of experience before you get to that stage. And so I guess to my, my short answer is that it's, it's absolutely possible for um, a statistician, a motivated statistician to perform simulations. Um, and if if they are doing that, if, if they um, are interested in, in learning how to do simulations, finding someone who, um, who can guide you through that process will make it a much easier, um, uh, a, a much easier task. Okay, yeah, excellent. And, and so the, hmm. I was just gonna say Rob, Buff, Rob works in like with teams of statistician in these more complex trials where you check each other's code and things, don't you, Rob, because the simulations got so complex, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Like everything, where things get more complicated, the burden of testing the things that you're doing, testing out your code, um, and and even implementing formal sort of um, software design principles becomes more and more critical. And so okay. sometimes often that requires other steps. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, for students who are interested, hopefully they'll reach out and then we'll guide them on how to reach out to you for further questions. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, the team has done a great job. Uh, we've just uh, uh, finished uh, on time. I would like to appreciate Julie and Rob for the great presentation and the insights. I would want to appreciate all the attendees for keeping time. We had uh, more than 1,000 attendees uh, with us, which is very, very great. This is a big record. Uh, finally, I want to thank the University of Nairobi and Kenyatta National Hospital for uh, hosting us and giving us the platform to share this. Uh, Dr. Karongo and team, uh, Cyrus Mugo and the KNH Research Office, we are really, really grateful for this platform. Otherwise, thank you very much, and we hope to invite you again for another talk uh, in the future. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Yes, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks.